So we would like. Yes, yes, you record my talk. I understand. Yeah. And the second problem is that usually reality, well, doesn't wait for your optimization. So it changes while the optimization is running. This is less of an issue if your optimization algorithm is super, super fast. Usually this causes your solution to be somewhat out of date the second that you emit it. So this causes us to create optimization problems that are no longer static, but dynamic optimization problems. And uh, Vladimir Slanovov already presented you a, a small analysis about the uh, uh, volume of literature on dynamic optimization problems, which is, uh, to be fair, frustratingly low compared to how much effort is invested into static optimization, especially considering that essentially most of real world optimization problems are on some level dynamic. Yeah, if you recognize your problem as dynamic, you can do some fancy things like adapt and tune your optimization algorithm while you update your optimization problem. And you maybe even introduce some measures of stability or robustness considering that uh, maybe it's not suitable to get the last 5% of optimization potential out of the current state of the problem when probably it will no longer be uh, valid at the time your solution has translated into a decision and is uh, starting to influence the system. And we have seen already in the talks before that Usually, when you apply black box optimization in form of evolutionary computation for dynamic optimization problems, you use some form of multi-population, partial population approach. But this is maybe not the, not the whole answer because uh, overall mass of literature on dynamic problems is still way too low. So in short, many uh, real world applications still run with the iterative static optimization cycle where you feed data into an optimization run, you let it finish, you make a decision, you feed data into an optimization run, uh, you let it finish, you make a decision. What you should do, what I believe everyone should do if their problem is dynamic, is some form of initialization step then create an ongoing, essentially open-ended optimization run, which constantly uses changes to update its own model about reality and emits decision when it deems necessary. Looks easy. I assure you very much it is not. Uh, here, two short pictures about why we actually care so much about dynamic optimization problems. For the rest of this talk slash tutorial, I will mainly deal with stacking operations, which is uh, mostly because this is a type of dynamic problem that translates very neatly between the academic and the real world as much as possible. We will see later uh, when this is not the case. Uh, you see on the on the left hand side stacking of large steel slabs, uh, and on the right side when these steel slabs are uh, essentially rolled into into coils and then put in a in a warehouse. This is something where you can very neatly tie optimization algorithm times to crane movements uh, to have an interesting problem, both from a real world and an academic view. Uh, dynamic optimization problems in this form, in comparison to the academic dynamic optimization problems like the, uh, like the generalized moving peaks, bring with themselves a good number of challenges. Uh, 
we have seen the mathematical formulation of a function being dependent both on the solution, or solution vector, and to the time point. Well, sadly, uh, this function f is not told to us by the uh, dynamic optimization problem. Uh, if you want to solve the, the dirty DUPs, you actually have to find or tune or learn your uh, objective function very much by yourself, which is uh, actually a massive undertaking. For many dynamic variations of static optimization problems, you can estimate, and it makes a lot of sense, uh, that the solution for the static optimization problem is correlated to the overall performance in the dynamic environment. It is intuitive, and in many cases it will make sense, but it is actually just pure speculation. And assuming you have only the real world process where you cannot turn back time, it is very, very difficult to prove that the static optimization goal and the dynamic uh, performance are in any way, shape or form correlated. Then of course you have to deal with all the information uh, kerfuffle in dynamic uh, systems like some, some information might be uncertain, some information might be missing at all. Uh, you, have to under you have to do actually a lot of work to keep your real world process, the process that translates the solution into actual decisions and the optimization process to keep all those synchronized, uh, you will have to invest some form of work. And then there is the problem of real-time coupling. That is actually, uh, I want to elaborate on that. Usually for many academic scenarios, you define the computational budget that your, uh, that your algorithm has in a form of, well, number of evaluations. When your optimization process is inherently tied to the real world and the real clock, uh, you will get some very interesting effects like uh, sequentially evaluating 1000 solutions is very, very much more expensive than evaluating 1000 solutions in parallel because usually you have a decently sized parallel computing infrastructure. And the second thing is that your uh, optimization budget now becomes part of your solution, because in some points in time, it might be advantageous for you to just not emit uh, the new best found solution and just give the algorithm the, an the another minute, another two minutes to find a, a suitable, good uh, solution in this time, a crane schedule before you start actual operations. So algorithm runtime and algorithm evaluation budget now becomes part of your solution vector, which has its own uh, intricate implications. Then of course, your solution might be good for right now. And then you have two or three changes and the solution becomes very, well, unstable or unfeasible or uh, loses a lot of its original potential. And lastly, and this is the point that I will like to talk about today, is if you deal with all these challenges, the question of which algorithm actually works best is by far not a simple one. Because you have the worst case of any time performance comparison that you can actually have. So um, full honesty, my talk is called benchmarking and not solving for a very good reason. I will not present you solutions to all these problems today. The only thing I can show you today is a simplified version of this real world problem where you can test your algorithms against. I cannot tell you what the best algorithm for these problems are. I can point you in a few interesting solution approaches, but as it is right now, and uh, as I understand the state of the art is, there is no, well, current state of the art algorithm to solve the dirty uh, dynamic optimization problems. 
So let's go into the more domain specific part uh, about using cranes to operate the warehouse dynamically. And in the simplest of all formulations, you essentially have, well, you essentially have a glorified pipeline. You have at some point in the warehouse, you have an arrival uh, area when you, well, in this case, we just call them blocks or uh, where these new blocks arrive and you have some form of output area where you will have to move your blocks under certain conditions so that they can leave the warehouse again. And in between you have buffer area, buffer stacks where you uh, allocate your, your blocks in the meantime. Usually you do this with a crane that takes a certain amount of time to uh, pull up or drop down a block and to move along the crane runway. And in one of the scenarios that I'm presenting you today, uh, these blocks are annotated with both a due date. This is the last point in time where you can, where you have to output the block until then, otherwise you incur penalties. Also, uh, you cannot uh, emit a block on the, on the handover or output area whenever you like. You have to wait until they are ready and you have to wait until the handover process is ready. Because usually uh, when you move large steel slabs out of a warehouse, you cannot just output and output and output block after block after block. You actually need to have people there and trucks there to remove uh, the blocks that you no longer want to have in your warehouse as fast as you possibly can, which is of course not infinitely fast. This is the easy formulation. And now I uh, can switch you to the slightly more difficult formulation, which is essentially in many modern uh, warehouses that operate any form of cranes, you usually have more of them. And well, one of our company partners actually uses five cranes in their, uh, in their stacking operations for uh, the scenarios we will be looking at today. We only use two and believe me, two cranes are enough to make the problem significantly harder. Uh, also, you can have more or fewer arrival and output areas. Uh, some scenarios even give you additional information like, okay, here is a rough estimation when the next arrivals will appear. Be aware, these times may not be completely accurate. Uh, your optimization algorithms most certainly will need to have some form of machine learning uh, component to estimate all forms of errors and times and speeds. Uh, in this scenario, we also see uh, the violet and blue coloring, uh, which corresponds to uh, the different output areas. Well, obviously you would need to move the blue blocks to the blue output area and the violet blocks to the violet output area. So this is essentially uh, a small domain model of a real world dynamic stacking operation. Uh, you will see that most of the challenges I've talked before can be adequately captured. Uh, with this model without introducing more of the, let's say real world baggage, like, uh, okay, how to interface with, the, with an actual production system and human worker times and other more complicated constraints that you will probably have to deal with when you try to move your algorithms to a real world application. Uh, the next question is when we have our domain model on which we want to perform optimization, uh, we will need some form of agreement on how we actually measure the performance. First of all, we do not want to block these arrival areas. Of course, every area has some form of maximum height. Uh, 
uh, we cannot put infinitely many stacks there because at some point you will simply hit either the ceiling of the warehouse or an area where you block movement of the crane. So there is an absolute limit to that. And you do not want to block the arrival time because then uh, the arrival stack, because then processes that create these blocks, like let's say a casting oven, uh, you will need to stop those. And then a lot of people will be very, very angry with you. Second criteria you could possibly imagine would be, well, the number of total blocks delivered on time. In the interest of, uh, of energy savings, you will probably want to minimize either the number of crane moves or the distance that the trains need, that the cranes need to travel. Of course, you want to minimize your due date violations. And in case of the second scenario where you have to match the colors, well, at some point you probably will be in a situation where you absolutely have to violate the, the color orientation. So keep those at a minimum, but maybe uh, there are other objectives that simply supersede this, uh, this pre-assignment. And also you can create a big number of matrices. Uh, to be fair, the problem is both multi-objective and uh, not multi-objective. In many cases, the first thing you will need to do is not find an algorithm that outperforms another algorithm in any of these uh, five uh, performance metrics. The first and frankly, pretty difficult uh, level of this game is to find any form of algorithm that uh, does not reach a completely infeasible uh, warehouse state where no longer any meaningful moves are possible. Uh, so if you have a running algorithm, I would say you can be pretty proud of yourself and then you can do the fine tuning in some form of, some form of multi-objective fashion. But usually uh, don't be fooled by these larger number of optimization criteria. Uh, you will not be dealing with crowding distances and uh, hyper volume contributions for your algorithms for a long time. Uh, since we're talking about solvers, this is pretty much everything that I can tell you about the solvers that we have fielded against these problems, essentially two uh, general approaches, which is first a rule-based solver that simply uses a number of handcrafted and or uh, learned rules to decide which uh, crane moves have priority at any given point in time. And that only emits the next matching move whenever a crane is ready. And the second is a more involved way where we map the dynamic warehouse operation problem to a static uh, block relocation problem. Uh, we solve the block relocation problem using a branch and bound uh, algorithm. You could also use uh, solve it via a meta heuristic like a, a genetic algorithm. And well, the next crane moves are then determined by the uh, solution we uh, have developed with the branch and bound variation. On that note, uh, we can usually solve with branch and bound uh, the abstracted um, warehouse scenarios that I'm presenting you here. In the real world, uh, the warehouse on the on the right side has over, I think over a thousand uh, individual buffer areas. Uh, to my knowledge, there is no branch and bound algorithm uh, that would ever finish on this scenario. So here you actually have to use the meta heuristic, but for the smaller uh, abstracted variations of the, uh, of the dynamic stacking operation, you can actually use uh, exact solvers to a actually pretty satisfying degree of performance. Yeah, here uh, 
a small comparison of the uh, of the two approaches that was published in a paper a few months ago. And here we see actually a pretty easy comparison between both algorithms, because at some point uh, the lines simply diverge and one of these algorithms constantly outperforms the other, except for handover utilization. Uh, here we see the, the overall uh, problem that you can have uh, that some algorithm might outperform another algorithm for a certain amount of time, but not forever. And the only actual performance measure that would really interest you is the forever performance, which is of course the one performance that you can never actually measure. So there are some, some shades in there. Uh, next thing is we present not only the model, but also the benchmark instances for these uh, dynamic stacking operations. Uh, problem, uh, these have actually a good number of parameters and it is very, very easy to make either a scenario that is so simple that you don't need any form of optimization or a scenario that is so hard uh, that no optimization algorithm ever, ever could perform even adequately in any way, shape or form. So we are currently using uh, queuing theory to estimate all of these parameters. Uh, and if you want to create your own dynamic optimization problems that is uh, in some form uh, building up or losing uh, a state, I would urge you to do it yourself to find a queuing theory or another theory that roughly describes your problem and not just uh, eyeball all these numbers because you will find that, uh, uh, that the parameter space for problems that are actually interesting to solve is extremely narrow. Yeah, this slide is mainly for, uh, for documentation purposes. We provide you with uh, benchmark instances of varying size, both in uh, buffer stacks and in uh, arrival and remover uh, speeds and utilization. Uh, yes, you don't need to implement everything yourself. We are hosting a yearly competition on these problems and you're all very welcome and invited to participate. Uh, we will look at the website live in a second. Uh, if you don't want to participate and think, uh, I don't care what the, what the guys in Upper Austria are doing, you can simply just take our code and maybe move from a dynamic stacking operation to any other uh, dynamic uh, optimization problem that you want using our software architecture. Speaking of software architecture, static optimization problems are usually defined by some form of problem interface. Solution goes in, quality goes out. Uh, the type of dynamic optimization problem I'm talking about now is substantially more intricate when it comes to software engineering. Because, because what you're essentially doing when you want to have uh, both a visualization and the uh, form of real world coupling, you need to create some form of message passing middleware that communicates both with your client that solves the, the optimization, that builds and solves the optimization problem and emits suggested uh, decision and the Dynamic simulation, on the other hand, that receives and sends messages about the decisions that you want the simulation to perform and the overall world state. If you're really fancy, you can program yourself a front end to have a visual representation of, the, uh, of what's going on in the simulation. Yes. Uh, I think 
we can go to the more practical part of my talk. Uh, under dunstack.adaptop.at, uh, you will find our competition website, which is running all year, even if the competition is not running and you can uh, test your algorithms against our problems anytime. You're, really, you're very welcome to. And for now, I would like to create myself a small stacking problem, three uh, buffer stacks, smallest utilization, and then try to create a small algorithm that at least does something with you. Uh, I'm not going to program everything concerning the software architecture and the message passing myself. We provide a C Sharp, C++, Rust, and Python starter kit. I will be using the C Sharp starter kit for the purposes of this demonstration, simply because it's the language that I am myself most familiar with. Uh, you can clone pretty much everything from the uh, GitHub repository, but for obvious reasons and brevity, I have already done that. Under Dunstack starter kits, I will use the C-sharp variation and I have already started that one in uh, Visual Studio. Uh, the message parsing code is already presented to you. And let's go down to the nitty gritty details uh, with you because I would like to create a very, very simplistic and even one could say dumb uh, rule-based optimizer with you. Uh, we have essentially a main loop retrieving and sending messages and a planner object with a plan moves uh, method that requires us to emit, uh, well, our decisions are, uh, our moves that we would like to send to the crane for it to perform. And the first I would like to do with you is, uh, well, if the handover is ready, we will need to move some block towards the handover stack. So let's ask if the handover is ready, if that is not the case. We don't need to care about this rule. If the handover is, uh, if the handover is ready, let's find ourselves the top blocks in the warehouse. We achieve that by asking all the buffer stacks in the world where they are not empty. Then we select ourselves uh, both the, the block and the corresponding stack. We can only use ready blocks and then we save ourselves all the potential candidates that we could move to the handover area in an array. Uh, I hope it is okay with you that from an intuitive point of view, I would like to move the uh, block with the lowest due date uh, to the handover first, because if possible, I do not want to incur due date violation penalties.
So I order my blocks by due date. I create for every block a new crane move. where we need to define the block ID, the source position ID, which is essentially just uh, the number of the, of the stack and the target ID. Target ID is always the handover. And now let's add all these moves that we've created to the uh, to the current schedule. And when we are asked to make our uh, heuristic schedule in the plan move methods, I will just add any possible move to the handover. That is, uh, that is available to us if the handover is ready, I would just add, add that to the current uh, schedule. Uh, you need to parameterize your program with the running simulation because you're sending essentially everything to our service at the University of Applied Sciences. So, uh, where is my web page? Uh, the experiment section where you can look on uh, upon your own started and finished and currently not running uh, experiments uh, shows you both the TCP endpoint, which I have already inserted as the first argument, and then requires you a GUI to specify with which simulation you essentially want to uh, communicate. Let me just add that and then run our first dynamic optimizer and quote this because it's, well, a very, very simplistic optimizer. So gods of compilation be with me, thank you. And now I can start the simulation and have a visualization of what is actually happening. We will need to wait until one block is ready until we can see uh, the effects of our uh, scheduler. But at first we see the first and probably best tool for benchmarking dynamic optimization algorithms, visual inspection. I think you can all agree with me. Well, we have blocks arriving on the arrival stack. We should probably do something about this. Uh, it is very, very, very hard to solve dynamic optimization problems without, uh, well, uh, domain specific inspection. There are papers about dynamic optimization problems with time linkage like the ones we have here where your solver makes decisions and has impacts on the next states. And they essentially usually come to the conclusion that in a on general basis, uh, we cannot solve these things. Right now we have accrued already due date violations because our rule only considers the topmost block of each stack. And since the stacks didn't spawn in an ordered fashion, uh, we well, we failed to dig out block number 11 here. 
Uh, since all of these scenarios are pretty much random, I am sorry for the wait time. I hope that block B4 will be uh, will reach a ready state sooner rather than later. Nonetheless, uh, this is essentially our very first, yeah. Our program sent the required uh, solution to the uh, to the schedule, and we moved our first block uh, to the to the handover stack. I was incurring uh, uh, an exception later because I did not care about all, uh, sequencing. Uh, all our uh, schedule entries correctly. But nonetheless, this is a, a small demo. You can, of course, do other simulations like, uh, let's create a, a more complicated issue with two cranes in the rolling mill scenario. I will not create a, a, a solver for that one only show you the visualization. Here we have two cranes. And at this point, it is actually very important to not only specify the schedule in a working order, but also uh, define the, uh, the precedence constraints between uh, moves that you create in order to tell the cranes whether they uh, have to wait for other operations until they can start with their current move. Lastly, uh, a few rule of thumbs that we have found uh, from the competition for generating handcrafted priorities, which is like uh, check if the block are ready, can the block uh, put on the handover in time or will you include due, uh, due date violations anyway? Uh, how much time do you have until the due date runs out? Uh, of course, it is always an interesting question. How many blocks are above which block in which stack? And does this change your priorities for which block you tackle first? For a more involved way, especially for the second current problems, our best working algorithms uh, separate the stacking problem from the crane scheduling problem, because those are essentially both two NP complete uh, problems in their own right. We usually do stacking operation first and after the stacking our optimizer provides us with the potential moves that we can make. Uh, we use uh, a scheduler that essentially solves a warped uh, two, uh, two uh, agent traveling salesman problem uh, to actually decide on the uh, real final and exactly time schedule for the simulation. Uh, I know I shouldn't talk about other conferences here. I just wanted to uh, tell you one thing. Last uh, This year we had 23 registered participants all over the world and not a single one attempted to submit a scoring run for the two crane problem, which should give you a small estimation on how the community perceives the difficulty of the two crane uh, staking operation. And you can do the interpolation yourself on how difficult it probably is to solve a five or more crane structure where you have evasion cascades, and you have to avoid train collisions and uh, blocking yourselves out of moves. So lastly, if I have the time, I would like to show you something about the analysis of these problems, which is a, a quite an interesting thing. Uh, you can track the performance of your algorithms without visually uh, looking at them by doing essentially a machine learning trick. 
you can try to capture uh, your, the current state of the warehouse and the current state of the algorithms by just throwing numeric features in, at them. Uh, here I have created about 30 of them. Uh, you can uh, differentiate it between useful and non-useful features by simply using them to predict the short-term uh, change in the objective that interests you, like uh, let's say two minutes in the, into the future, and then weigh all of these measures by variable impact. And then you can do visualizations of every measured uh, warehouse state on the time axis and visualize them, for example, via t-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. On the left side, we see the states of the warehouse for the, uh, for the one crane scenario colored by, uh, by the scenario ID. I presented earlier where we have different uh, different characteristics in terms of utilization, where we see you can separate these uh, different scenarios very easily and you have very, very distinct uh, outer clusters, which is an artifact of the, uh, of the fact that the algorithm that was performing while I took these uh, analysis measurements uh, was performing quite better in terms of how the, how the warehouse looks than the original uh, initialization of the stacks. And on the right side, we see something very interesting. We see, uh, the, we see the, the embedding for the two crane scenario and we have these uh, longer, uh, let's say worm or snake-like structures uh, we can explain those when we look, uh, when we introduce uh, time dependency and transform our, all of our uh, data points into transitional graphs and then plot them via spring layout. Uh, all of these uh, snakes or worms are essentially uh, states where the algorithm did not manage to perform adequately. Uh, locked itself into some form of state where no moves were no longer possible because all of the, uh, the, the stacks were filled to the brim and then uh, the algorithm essentially stopped operation, which is somewhat depressing for me uh, because it means that we are still a good way away from having open-ended prescriptive artificial intelligence that... Uh, does all this range scheduling for, for us because essentially you always need to have a human uh, overlooking the, the open-ended optimization algorithm for well deteriorating states. And with that, I thank you for your time. I am both very open to question and your contributions to this field, because I think we have way too little in terms of dynamic optimization. Uh, thank you very much, Bernard, for your very impressive presentation. Dear colleagues, please, your answers. Uh, sorry, your <laughs> questions. Okay, I have one question, a little bit independent of the talk. Uh, do you differ, make the difference between non-stationary optimization problem and dynamic optimization problem? To be fair, I'm not sure whether this is mathematically fully correct. I would say a non-stationary optimization problem is one that changes completely independent uh, from whatever the algorithm does. And we only have to track the optimum. And I would say really dynamic are those things that uh, have the uh, algorithm uh, problem interaction where whatever you do causes actual, uh, uh, causes actual changes in the problem state. But I don't know whether this is mathematically all that correct. 
Yeah, the dynamic uh, behavior can be described, for example, at least theoretically, with differential equation. Non-stationary uh, behavior <clears throat> originally cannot be described anyhow. I and only to be to be fully fair, I don't know whether the very discrete uh, stacking problem can be described by differential equation, but I, if I have to guess, I would probably say it can. Yeah, non-stationary behavior means that, uh, let me say, uh, graph of function landscape can simply occasionally jump out of uh, current position, not just uh, slightly go according to some uh, well, maybe unknown law. Uh, the, uh, the, arrival, the arrival of a block in that case would be a jump. It would be a single discrete event. But I think you can very accurately, uh, let's say, uh, smooth it out with a differential equation. You can uh, approximate such a jump, I think, uh, fairly well. I am not sure whether there are differential equations for such a problem that is so discrete in nature, but I think the, the world of mathematics is vast and you could do something very unholy to actually create a, a differential equation approximation of the problem here. Okay, I, I see, thank you. Dear colleagues, any question, please? Yes, I have a question. Yeah, Ivan, please. And thank you once again for this topic. It's very interesting according to industrial applications. So my first question is, am I understanding correctly that uh, dynamic optimization problems and dynamical programming are different because in dynamic optimization, you don't know in advance the reaction of the system or what will happen in the system later that is a loaded question to be mm -hmm. fair uh, in this case we don't know what happens in advance but to be fair you can learn it you have enough domain uh, knowledge that you can uh, i know for sure that you can learn with something like reinforcement learning your own regret functions uh, and you can probably hard code some form of system response and then go into, uh, into dynamic pro uh, programming. I, this is something I should have mentioned within the talk, but uh, these forms of dynamic optimization problems actually open the, the playing field for different strategies to compare. You can do reinforcement learning, you can do essentially everything with some form of neural network that just emit priorities. You can do dynamic programming. You can build yourself a domain model and apply a black box meta heuristic like we are doing. But at the end of the day, everything you do that takes messages and emits messages is essentially a possible candidate for the competition. So I am not sure whether I can define well this is dynamic problem programming and this is dynamic uh, optimization there is no clear boundary to that in any way shape or form i'm sorry that i have to give such a cop-out answer but no no that's that's very good answer thanks and uh, you've already mentioned this link to a second question where are there participants who use uh, like reinforcement learning uh, to my knowledge, none. I know mm -hmm. of at least one that tried, but they didn't. Reinforcement learning always involves a lot of time. And yeah, yeah. for just a competition, uh, people often say, ah, I don't care. Mm -hmm. I think they didn't get it up to the point where they could compete with the, with the handcrafted priority rules. And at some point they said, just said, okay, uh, no matter. I have other things to do, which saddens me to an unbelievable degree. Okay. And this Dean Stack framework, does it actually allow somebody to try this kind of approaches or um, is it not very fitting to this reinforcement learning? Uh, I think you, uh, you very much can 
you have mm. to decide on a few things yourself, like uh, what is your your regret or loss function or or mm. so uh, you would have to you would have to extract it yourself from the domain model because the the software we give you right now does not specify which of the objectives you should actually follow. You can do that however you want, but I think it's very much appropriate to use here. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. So can I uh, ask answers? Yes, sure. Ask question, uh, Alexander Garno. Uh, what about relationship between your algorithms and algorithms from maximum Pantragin principle? Maybe in discrete variant. Sorry, I have a, a maximum what principle? Ma maximum Pantragin principle. I am sure I have to be fully honest. I don't know this class of algorithms. Maybe I know them under a different name. Maybe I haven't heard of them at all. So I cannot fairly answer the question. I would have to look that up first. Thank you. Antragin is the name of person. Maximum principle in dynamic optimization is one of uh, main approaches, at least it was. Is it a, a black box optimization approach? Is it a... Uh... No. Okay. No, it's not. Okay, here I have to fully admit, maybe I'm out of the, uh, out of my water here and I ha have not heard of this type of dynamic optimization approach. Alexander Yurich, is it enough? I don't know <laughs> <laughs> about principle bandwagon, I know more. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Any other question, please? I have one more, if it's possible. Um, can you share if, if there is a grow growing interest from the industries in this kind of problems? Or... Uh, I can I can only share what we see from the industry in Upper Austria. I don't have a literature review on that, but to be fair, yes, yes, uh, the these problems inherently. Uh, relates to the industry 4.0 trend, which is pretty, I would say pretty substantial right now, because the most important thing that you can do with the also celebrated digital twin of your, of your factory or system is essentially uh, make decisions based on it. And all of those are in their core dynamic optimization problems with time linkage, AKA, uh, problem algorithm interaction. So I would say they are supremely relevant from a real world point of view, but the, uh, the literature on it is somewhat lacking. And the most prominent reason I would think about is because they are pretty difficult to implement from a software point of view. It's simply a lot of work. You can easily test a few hundred algorithms on a traveling salesman problem, but to create your own dynamic feedback loop uh, with some form of real time constraint things, that is actually a lot of work. And for many researchers, sadly, too much work for a paper. Okay, thanks. Well, our time for this tutorial is out. Uh, thank you very much, 